Hello everyone, this is Spencer Snowling from Hatch and I'd like to uh, welcome you to today's GPSX webinar. Thank you for coming. I have my colleague Nicholas Piccolo with me here uh, again today and the two of us are going to be talking about modeling side stream nutrient removal and recovery and how you can model it with the various uh, advanced features of GPSX. So the agenda for today is um, I'm going to just introduce a, a few thoughts about uh, how and why side stream nutrient removal um, and, and recovery of phosphorus is a, is a use, uh, uh, useful thing to do and talk about some of the challenges associated with it. And then we have sort of two sections to the main presentation. I'm going to speak first about nitrogen. And so I'll be uh, talking about how we can model uh, deammonification uh, in GPSX. Uh, using the Animox biomass type. And I have two different demonstrations that I'm going to run on my desktop. And then Nick will take over and he's going to talk about the phosphorus portion for today and talk about uh, struvite and how it can we can model the precipitation uh, and recovery of it. And he also has some desktop demonstrations as well. And then uh, lastly, we'll uh, have a few thoughts, uh, winding things up, a little tips and suggestions about uh, how to set things up for your simulations. And then uh, as mentioned previously, if there are any questions at that point, we'll stick around and answer some of those. Okay, so to get things rolling and put it in uh, a little bit of context, uh, so the, the wastewater stream that comes into conventional biological nutrient removal uh, facilities contains uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, and, and it'll be in many, many different forms. Uh, some of it will be soluble, some of it will be associated or tied up in the solids that are coming into uh, the plant. And so they get transformed and they get separated and, and have a, their own certain pathway through the, uh, the facility. Uh, any of the nutrients that are tied up in the solids or bound to the solids in one way or another, uh, for sure, uh, many, much of them are, are going to be removed when it goes through the primary clarifier and then go out through the primary sludge. Um, and then whatever makes its way over to the secondary system is going to be uh, transformed in, in many different ways. It kind of depends on the biological nutrient removal design. So if it's doing it chemically, chemically removing phosphorus or if it's doing it um, uh, biologically removing it, uh, nonetheless, it is for the most part going to try and concentrate uh, the nitrogen and the phosphorus into solids, which are then, of course, recycled and can be wasted out. And if you have, uh, as we're going to go into here in a moment, if you have a system that is uh, also reducing uh, nitrogen to N2 gas, then, of course, that's going to be lost to the atmosphere as we move along. So whatever comes along and is going to be bound up in the solids is going to be uh, taken out uh, through the waste activated sludge and that both that and the primary sludge are going to be taken to the biosolids handling facility. And then, of course, you might have a little bit of nutrients left over. Hopefully the smallest amount possible, if your design works well, um, uh, will go out in your effluent. Okay, so when those two sludge streams arrive in the uh, solids handling uh, section, they'll probably be going through, most of the time anyway, some sort of thickening process, and you uh, will probably have some sort of filtrate that is uh, containing um, uh, some of the soluble components that are still there at that point, and they will get sent probably back to the beginning of the system. Um, but the most of the solids, those thickened solids, are going to go into uh, an anaerobic digester or some other equivalent kind of technology for, for doing digestion of the solids. You want to, of course, remove and reduce those down to the smallest amount possible before you pay to have uh, them taken away. So uh, one side effect, though, of course, of the anaerobic digestion system when it is hydrolyzing and breaking down those solids is that it is now going to release a lot of those nutrients back into the liquid again, so uh, as ammonia and insoluble phosphorus. So those are things that are sort of the, the, the downside of that uh, anaerobic treatment process is that uh, you're going to, all that time and effort we spent to get the solids into uh, the biomass, we're not going to get them back out again. So um, typically your digested solids would then go through some sort of dewatering process like a centrifuge and your centrate will also go back to the head of the plant. Now the difference of the centrate is if it's after the digester, you're going to have very likely high concentrations of nutrients coming back. 
So you could have, say, ammonia in the hundreds of milligrams per liter, and uh, you could have phosphorus in the uh, sort of tens or even, even 100 milligrams per liter of phosphorus coming back around to the head of your plant. Um, the amount of flow will be low, but the concentration will be high. So it can be a very significant amount of loading coming back uh, as you go out. So, um, so that's how we sort of uh, understand the distribution of nutrients throughout that system. And if you look at the two things together, what's really happening is, you know, we're sort of exchanging the nutrients back and forth between the two different parts of the plant. Um, so you can see here, for example, we're taking those two sludge sources and we're putting them, taking them over to the solid side of the plant. But then after processing, we are bringing back the nutrients in soluble form back to the head of the plant. And, and so the idea behind doing side stream treatment is you don't want to bring them back to the plant, uh, the mainstream part of the plant again. You want to treat them and keep them in the side stream part. Um, and then, of course, uh, even make use of them and recover them if you can. So we're trying to basically have technologies and treatment processes that will kind of intercept uh, the nutrients um, uh, and not bring them back and put them in your mainstream system so that they'll just go all the way back around for the next time again. So, um, so that's what we're going to be talking uh, about today. So I'm going to start out, as I mentioned, talking about, uh, uh, sorry, I'm talking about nitrogen today. So I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the Animox process, a demonification process. Um, and that is the idea there is that we are going to be trying to get rid of that high concentration of ammonia that's coming out of the digester uh, so that we don't have to send it back to the beginning of the activated sludge process again. Okay, so if we take a look at the biological pathways uh, to get rid of ammonia, uh, normally in that nitrification process, it's a, it's a two-step process where we're going to oxidize the ammonia to nitrite, and then we have a different set of biomass that is going to oxidize the nitrite to nitrate. And so each one of those steps in the process uh, takes up some oxygen to get that uh, job done. And those are autotrophic biomass and they're in an aerobic environment where they're using up oxygen, a fairly significant amount of oxygen demand to, to be able to oxidize it from uh, ammonia all the way to nitrate. Now, uh, if you're also in a facility where you're, go you're also needing to get rid of the nitrates too, then you're going to have to go through the process of denitrification. And in that case, uh, the, the efficient way to do that is with heterotrophic biomass that we uh, have growing in an anoxic environment. So in that case, we need carbon uh, that we are going to grow uh, anoxically, uh, have the heterotrophs grow anoxically with carbon, and then they're going to uh, uh, basically reduce the nitrate to nitrite, and then the nitrite to nitrogen gas. And then once it's gas, then it'll, it'll off gas, we get mass transfer, and it goes up and out of the system. And so that's an effective removal of, of all of the nitrogen. So uh, as I'm sure you know, this is a very common process and there's many different uh, designs that can do this in, in, in a fairly efficient way. But when you're talking about those very, very high concentrations, there's a couple more options and other ways that can be done uh, in, a, in a more efficient way without having to, to spend a lot of uh, oxygen and a lot of carbon to get rid of those hundreds of milligrams per liter of ammonia. So uh, one of them is to basically just do partial nitrification. So your nitritation in this case. Uh, you're doing that first step, getting it uh, with your ammonia oxidizers, the AOBs, getting it to nitrite, and then from there directly denitrifying it to nitrogen gas. So uh, that basically saves us on some oxygen demand and it saves us on some carbon demand because we're not going all the way to nitrate and back again. Uh, and of course, it, a little bit less biomass, biomass production because you don't have to grow quite as many bugs to do that job. You're, you're basically not needing the NOBs uh, doing their thing up at the top there. An even more efficient way of doing it is with Animox biomass, where you have uh, uh, a different type of, of uh, uh, heterotroph that's growing. That's basically saying, "I'm gonna, we're gonna start with taking that first step, and the, uh, with the autotrophs doing that first step of, of nitrification, and so you're gonna end up at nitrite. But we don't, we we set it up, and it's deliberately designed so that we don't actually nitrify all of the ammonia. You leave some of the ammonia around, and you get rid of, let's say, roughly half-ish or a little more than half uh, of it, uh, oxidizing it up to nitrite." So then that combination of ammonia and nitrite together uh, in this ratio that's shown here can then be reduced directly to nitrogen gas in an anoxic or in an anaerobic environment by the Animox biomass. 
So this allows actually for very nice uh, and efficient use of uh, the system to be able to get from ammonia to uh, a complete uh, uh, nitrogen removal uh, to nitrogen gas and doing it very in a way very cheaply. Uh, very little carbon, if at all, required, and we're only going to have oxygen required to do that first sort of half step of the, of the nitrification part. So this uh, process is modeled, all of these processes are modeled, as a matter of fact, in the Mantis 2 and Mantis 3 models in GPSX. And so, but specifically this Animox process is the one that we're going to be uh, demonstrating uh, today. So I'll mention that uh, there are a number of different types of demohonification technologies available in the wastewater market. Here's here some of the uh, companies that are doing that. These are various types of different technologies that are all there to essentially create a very animox friendly environment to be able to do that job. Uh, many of them are designed specifically for the, for the idea of doing it in the side stream to, to take those very high concentrations of ammonia and be able to do that shortcut uh, nitrification and then denitrification right to uh, getting rid of it uh, as nitrogen gas. Now, in the model, in our Mantis II model in GPSX, we have that anaerobic autotrophic biomass there, uh, and we basically have uh, this Animox uh, microorganism. It's, it's basically the same, treated the same way as all of the other biomass that is there uh, in, the, in the system. So uh, we have a series of equations that describe the growth. We use those same kinds of monode equations that we use for heterotrophs and autotrophs and so on. And in those cases, uh, we also have switching functions as part of the uh, growth equation itself so that it turns on the right equation at the right time under the right circumstances. And we can grow those Animox biomass separately from all of the other ones with their own set of kinetics. So this stoichiometry that I'm showing along the bottom here is how we are transforming the various forms of uh, nitrogen and COD in our system when that Animox biomass goes. So, so for example, the most important thing to look at here is that we have uh, you know, uh, ammonia and nitrite that are being uh, uh, taken up here. And then uh, we can see it's producing N2 gas and some biomass and some water and so on, and a little bit of nitrate too. So, so basically when this is happening, this is the ratio that we're gonna be using up the ammonia and nitrate and producing the N2 gas and a little bit of nitrate. So one key thing to note about the kinetics of these processes is that the maximum growth rate for Animox biomass is very low compared to all of the other biomass types that we have in GPSX. And that is reflective of what has been observed in reality. So it, if, if you washed out all of your Animox biomass, it would take a very long time to grow them all back again. Um, uh, so in the in this particular case, you know, like uh, for example, in regular heterotrophs, you'd, you'd have a growth rate of, of like say three or four one over day units, and then uh, for for autotrophs, uh, AOBs and NOBs, you're talking about like point something, point five, point seven, something like that, and then uh, for Animox, it's point oh one eight. So it's like a whole order of magnitude lower than that. So, so it's, uh, it's very, very slow according to the process. So therefore you have to be able to design your system accordingly. Okay, so let's model uh, uh, something. Let's model this deammonification system. And uh, I just want to emphasize again, this is automatically built into all of our biological models. So in GPSX, anytime you see one of these tanks that's got the, the brown look to it, that means that there is a biological model in that unit process when you put it on the drawing board. So they all have Animox already built into it. You don't have to do anything special. There's no special Animox reactor. All the reactors contain Animox. So for this two-step deammonification, we have to do the nitritation step first to get some of the ammonia into nitrite so that we have that right mixture of the two things going into the Animox. And then a separate Animox reactor uh, that needs to be uh, completely anoxic. So um, the, the uh, nitritation tank, of course, is gonna be doing this aerobically. So it's gonna be an aerated tank and the Animox tank is gonna be an anoxic tank. 
Now, uh, the most optimal way to do this is at a bit warmer temperature. You have to do it at a fairly long SRT because of that slow growth rate and neutral pH range and so on. Um, so we'll just take a quick look at how to set those things up. Uh, carbon source may be required. It does require some. I found that for the example that we've got put together here today that I didn't need any external carbon. Everything that was coming along from the, di the digester itself was, uh, was good enough. Okay, so... You can use a regular, ordinary, aerated CSDR tank uh, to do your nitritation step. So uh, we just have to size it accordingly, and then we have to, in this particular case, suggesting that, uh, you know, at that optimal setting, you may want to put it up to a little bit warmer uh, than normal, if that's appropriate for your particular system, and then set the DO set point to whatever is appropriate to get the job done for this uh, partial uh, nitrification step to get it to nitrate. So a combination of the right amount of air and the right amount of, of SRT in this particular tank, the right amount of residence time, will allow you to control so that you can do the first step, but not the second step. Okay, and then when you go to the Animox tank, please select the anoxic CSDR. And of course, there are no uh, aeration settings here. It's basically just all about setting uh, the maximum volume. And then so you can have to, again, figure out the correct volume to be able to do that. And as you'll see here shortly, uh, I've actually got, uh, oh, here it is right here. So basically that Animox step. Also, we've included for this particular example, uh, the way that I've seen it set up in a couple of these side stream facilities in real life is that they actually concentrate the Animox biomass uh, a little bit in this reactor by having a solid separation unit after it and then recycling the sludge back in again. Now, this happens to be a, a, a nice, interesting, common way to do it too, because uh, as I understand it, uh, you know, Animox is a little heavier than regular the biomass, uh, but, but mostly it's because it grows in this sort of granule format. It's easy to separate it out in a hydrocyclone and then uh, concentrate that and send it back to the Animox tank. So we've got this two-step process here, uh, one to get us so that we've moved like roughly half-ish amount of the uh, ammonia up to nitrite, and then that combination of ammonia nitrate into the Animox tank. All right, so what you'll find if everything has been done properly is that we can open up the concentration menu from the output variables and then take a look directly at whether we're growing the right proportions of biomass for all of these things. So, uh, so we can see here for this example, uh, we can, we're actually growing uh, ammonia oxidizer biomass, AOBs, that they're doing that first step for us. We have those. And then we're not growing the NOBs, or not hardly at all. So that's correct. That's what we want to see. We want to have uh, that first step that gets us to nitrate. Then in that second step for the Animox, uh, we can see here we are indeed growing Animox biomass. So Excuse me, if you're ever doing, you know, this kind of modeling and you want to understand the relative proportions of your biomass types, you can always just right click on any tank, go to the output variables menu and open up concentrations and you got to scroll down towards the bottom of that menu and then you can see the exact proportions of all the different um, uh, uh, biomass types that you're growing in your system and you can confirm that yes I am or I'm not growing the ones that I want to grow. Okay, so let's uh, jump straight to doing a demonstration here. And uh, so this is the layout that I was just showing you before. We have a regular BNR system here doing, uh, you know, full uh, nitrification in this case. And so we're wasting the primary and secondary sludge here through a digester dewatering. And then here is our two-step process nitritation tank followed by an Animox tank where we're concentrating some of the biomass back again. So I'm just going to run a steady state solution to the model first. And we'll take a look at the nitritation reactor first, just to sort of show where you would be able to typically see uh, the results that you would be interested in. So I'm just going to drag this down so we can see these, these concentrations here. So let's start by looking at the ammonia that's coming into and going out of our nitritation tank. So the ammonia coming in after that digester and after the dewatering was 362 milligrams per liter. And then we can see that leaving, it is 151. So we got rid of a little more than half of the ammonia. And we can see that the nitrite goes from basically zero up to 203. And the nitrate is relatively small. It's basically uh, not uh, doing that second step at all. It was zero coming in and only four going out. So basically we moved out of this 362, we moved about 200 milligrams per liter over to nitrite, which is exactly what we wanted. 
Okay, so now I can double click on the Animox tank and we can take a look at what is going over there. So in this case, let's look at this proportion coming in. As I mentioned, uh, we've now got 150 of ammonia and we've got 200 of nitrite coming in and not very much nitrate. Uh, those two combinations, that's the right proportion that we're looking for. And then in the Animox reactor, the Animox biomass is growing and doing its thing. And you can see that it drops those, both of them all the way down to under three milligrams per liter. So it's basically removing a, a you know 350 milligrams per liter uh, more or less out of there. We can see we actually do get a bit of nitrate uh, generated as you as you would expect based on that stoichiometry that I showed earlier. But if you take a look at the total sum of the total nitrogen uh, going across here, uh, you know this is like 360 something uh, being dropped down to essentially a, 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 you know about 24 milligrams per liter. So so that's very efficient, and we're doing that completely. Um, uh, only the only thing that we're spending, so to speak, to make that happen is the oxygen in the nitritation tank, just the first step of that nitrification process. So, and then we get all of the denitrification without any extra carbon and without any extra, and we got rid of all that ammonia uh, without having to spend any more oxygen. So we kind of got that part for free. Okay, so let me go back to my slides. Oops, sorry, okay. And we can see here uh, now that it is possible to uh, model the Animox uh, biomass in a biofilm context as well. So if you're a GPSX user, you know that we have an attached growth process section and we have a large number of different types of biofilm models. And in those models, we grow different layers of biofilm and each one of those has a, a biological reaction matrix in it. So there are a number of different kinds of technologies that use biofilm to take advantage of the Animox process, but to do it in a single tank rather than have it as a staged process like I was just showing you. In this case, the Animox uh, reactor uh, contains uh, media and the media then has biofilm growing on it. So, so you can see here uh, on the outside uh, of the media is where we would have the bulk liquid and it would be uh, aerated to a certain degree. And that would allow uh, some of the oxygen to, to penetrate into the biofilm along with the ammonia that we are trying to treat and get rid of. And you do end up with this sort of um, aerobic zone on the outside of the biofilm. But then once you get inside, as it penetrates in further, it will have taken that first step and gone to nitrite. And then we can have the Animox growing on the inside where it is in, in an, an anoxic environment. And so in this case, it's basically just sort of like mixing those two reactors, reactors together uh, and having them sort of staged on the biofilm itself. So you're going to have uh, aerobic on the outside and oxic on the inside, and you can grow your animox in there and get that same kind of process. So we don't have to do anything special in GPSX to model this. You can basically just grab our regular MBBR reactor, specify the appropriate size, you can specify the uh, amount of media that would be present, and then you would have to aerate that system to get this, this outer zone of aerobic uh, uh, activity. Uh, so therefore, that's gonna be an important thing to get specified uh, correctly. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, now we actually have an entire separate webinar on our YouTube channel about how to set up a biofilm model and specifically how to set up an IFAS and MBBR. So I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail right now about this, but I just will mention that you have to set the physical settings, uh, the volumes and so on, the amount of media that you have uh, used there, the, the fill fraction, um, and then also the operational settings. And this is where you would set um, the airflow that is required to, to sort of partially aerate that part of the biofilm. All the rest of these here in terms of the mass the transport and the you know, diffusion coefficients and so on, and all of this kinetic stuff, you can probably leave at the default values. Right, okay, so I'm gonna show you basically the same layout that we just did before, except we've replaced the two-step uh, uh, demonification with this one step Anitamox type process where we have biofilm growing on media that is in this tank. The good thing about running this and what we've shown in many of our other webinars is that you can actually plot these profiles. It's a basically looking at a, a concentration gradient through the depth of the biofilm. 
So these are available, and I'm going to show you this in the example here in a moment. I just wanted to highlight that you can actually plot the uh, biomass types as they're distributed inside that biofilm. And you can also look at the, the depth of the oxygen penetration and all those things too. So the oxidizer, sorry, the uh, ammonia oxidizer biomass, you can see the AOBs here. Um, they're growing. Uh, not The very first thing you'll see here, the one layer is actually the bulk liquid. And then this is the first biofilm layer, second biofilm layer, third et cetera, et cetera. So it goes from the outside to the inside. So we can see you got lots of, of, uh, of, of concentration of AOBs on the outside here, meaning that's that first step where a lot of the air is, and that's where you'll get that, that nitritation step. So let's take a look at this in action. So I'll go back to GPSX. I'm going to go over to my other layout. Uh, by the way, this layout that I showed you is actually one of the sample layouts that you can get to from this menu right here. So, okay, now I'm going to go over to the uh, biofilm version of this. And you can see here, this is the, uh, the tank. And so I'm going to run this uh, just to steady state again. So let's take a look at, uh, there's our biofilm uh, system. And we can see uh, that uh, we have, just like the other one, the, the feed coming in from the dewatering is 364 milligrams per liter of ammonia. And it's dropping it down to 36, and we got a little bit of nitrate, a little nitrate. So uh, you, of course, don't see that step in between because it's just all one reactor. But we're getting that, you know, sort of 90% type removal uh, out of this system here because it's doing that uh, and growing that Animox right on there. Okay, so I want to show you actually some of those profiles because I, as, that's always kind of a useful thing uh, to take a look at. Um, and again, I'll just I'll just reiterate what's happening here is we've got the the liquid concentration here on the left, and then as we look at these layers, that's going from the outside to the inside of the biofilm. Uh, so the media would be over here on the right. So our DO, of course, is uh, one and a half out here in the liquid, and then it kind of dissipates pretty quickly as you go into the into the biofilm. I mean, oxygen is being transferred in, but there's not a lot of residual left at that point. Uh, and we can see here that the AOBs are distributed more towards the outside. And then the Animox biomass is sort of in the middle. And we can see we basically don't have any NOBs at all. And that's what we want. We do not want to take that second step because then the, uh, we wouldn't have any enough nitrite to be able to support the Animox uh, process. Okay, so what you can do is um, you can do a lot of really interesting things with this type of uh, system here. You could, of course, all the regular biological uh, power of, of modeling is available to you here. What if the influent characterization was different? What if the uh, tank sizes were different? More media, less media, uh, different temperatures, you know, all of those things are relevant to, to doing this. And, and uh, so um, it, is, it is a nice way to sort of be able to look into and really dig into the details of what's going on in your side stream system. Uh, I did a little sensitivity analysis, which I quite liked uh, uh, to set up for this webinar. Um, and this is it here. And so there's a lot of moving parts when you're, when you're, when you're doing this kind of a system here. But uh, what I did was I ran it at a lot of different DO set points here, sort of from, from basically no oxygen all the way up to five milligrams per liter. Now this is in the liquid, right? So that's also gonna mean more, more oxygen going into the biofilm. And uh, now looking at the effluent from the, uh, from the uh, Animox tank there with the media in it, you can see that there's the, the, the ammonia here starts out high, drops down, and then comes back up again. Uh, it's because there's sort of this sweet spot here where, you know, if you go too low, then you're not actually getting enough nitrite into the system. You're not uh, actually, get, uh, you know, that first step of the nitrification process is not enough. And so um, you need to, to improve that. And if you go too high, then you end up over here where you're not going to have any Animox biomass because you're going to have, a, it's not going to be an anoxic environment on the inside of that biofilm. So what you'll find is there's sort of this sweet spot right there, sort of between one and a half and two milligrams per liter, where we're just getting exactly the right amount here. This we, we're plotting on this side over here, um, removal efficiency of, of total nitrogen. And we can see here in red that, you know, that's sort of the, the best spot right there, uh, trying to get rid of that. Okay, so what I'm gonna do then is just wind up with a, with a few thoughts about modeling the Animox. Um, so in this case, the, uh, you know, as I mentioned a couple of times, there's nothing extra special you have to do to set up Animox. It's already built into all of our models. So if the conditions for Animox are correct, 
then they will grow. Uh, so you need to have that right ratio of, of ammonia and nitrite, and it needs to be an anoxic system, and it needs to have the you know a little bit of carbon available to it, and it needs to have that long SRT because the growth rate is so slow for those. So basically you can use any configuration of the different types of biological reactors that you will see, it's all there. But of course, most of the typical applications we see, <coughs> excuse me, are using the CSTR and uh, MBDR reactors because that kind of reflects the technology that's out there. Okay, so that's what I, all I had to say for nitrogen today. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand it over to Nick and he's going to talk uh, about phosphorus. All right. Uh, thanks, Spencer. So yeah, as uh, Spencer said, I'm going to be talking about phosphorus removal, uh, specifically phosphorus removal via struvite precipitation. <clears throat> so uh, the first thing I'm going to do is... Um, just give a little bit of a background on struvite before I actually dive into the modeling. Uh, so what struvite is, it's basically a mineral that uh, does contain our two kind of uh, nutrients of interest. So it contains ammonia and it contains phosphate. Um, and it's a pretty uh, common precipitant uh, at uh, wastewater treatment facilities. You've probably heard of it. Um, and it can actually cause a lot of problems. So one one way it causes problems is when it precipitates, it can scale on belts or in pipes. Uh, it can also clog pumps or tanks. And um, there's some pretty high costs associated with um, with struvite removal uh, or prevention. And the thing is, we do end up having to pay those high costs because struvite can really decrease the performance. It's, this is kind of an extreme example I have I have here, but this pipe with uh, the excessive struvite scaling, you can obviously tell that maybe the flow through area there is probably one tenth of the original size, and that's really going to reduce the plant capacity. So if you don't have a way to prevent struvite or to remove struvite, uh, you're going to have some serious issues. Um, so this kind of leads uh, or has led, I guess, recently to uh, an increasing in interest in struvite recovery uh, from dewatering side streams at water resource recovery facilities. Uh, so just a bit about why to recover um, aside from the uh, process benefits. Uh, struvite contains, as I said, nitrogen and phosphorus, which are major macronutrients for plant growth. So we can actually use it as a fertilizer or for land applications in ag agriculture. Um, so that kind of just shows there's kind of a twofold benefit to recovering struvite. We get that economic benefit, the actual selling of the fertilizer, we can make a little bit of money off that. And then we also have the process benefit that we kind of discussed before. So hopefully if we're recovering struvite uh, at a very specific location of the facility and doing it in a controlled manner, then we're going to reduce all that scaling and clogging uh, from struvite precipitation in those undesirable locations. And uh, another side benefit is that there's actually going to be that reduction in ammonia and phosphate load back in the recycle stream, like what Spencer was talking about with the uh, deammonification, uh, kind of removing the nitrogen load back to the uh, recycle stream, back to the headworks. We see the same thing here. Uh, so it can reduce the demand on the treatment process uh, quite significantly in some cases, and that can have the effect of even improving effluent quality or reducing the aeration demand in the mainstream process. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit now just uh, about how we actually model uh, struvite precipitation in GPSX, just kind of the nitty gritty details. So this is the chemical uh, equation for struvite precipitation. And immediately we can see that high pH environments are going to be preferential here because we have the ammonium form of ammonia, uh, which is most uh, prevalent around the pH of 8 to 10. Uh, so high pH is obviously a uh, big uh, factor in struvite precipitation. We also see uh, a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one molar ratio is needed of magnesium, ammonium, and phosphate. Now there's typically enough ammonium and phosphate already in the wastewater, but we are in most cases going to have to add magnesium uh, to get that struvite precipitation. <clears throat> All right, so this equation shows how we actually model the rate or, uh, or sorry, the rate of struvite precipitation uh, or the dissolution in GPSX. Um, so the first thing to note is kind of what I said before, um, pH is really important here because you can see that these uh, uh, ions in the equation are actually, yeah, they're ions, they're in their ionic form, it's not just the total concentration. Uh, so the 
pH estimation is important. Uh, so the pH estimation functionality in GPSX is pretty useful in a case like this for getting accurate precipitation results because the pH obviously plays a large role in the speciation of these ions. Um, and just to talk a bit about the driving force here, the equation is actually uh, pretty simple when you look at it. It's basically just the uh, product of the soluble concentrations minus the product of the soluble of the solubility constant multiplied by the precipitant saturation. So basically what that means is if the soluble concentrations are higher, we're going to see struvite precipitation. And then if the other term in the equation is higher, we're going to see struvite dissolution back into the solution. So it's a pretty easy to understand equation, but it's very effective for modeling what's actually going on in the process. <clears throat> All right, so now I'm going to highlight quickly something I'm calling the undesirable struvite hotspots. So these are just places in a resource recovery facility that uh, unwanted struvite precipitation is known to occur or can occur. So as you might guess, uh, these are mostly just places where we can get some non-negligible uh, concentrations of ammonia and phosphate and some slightly higher than neutral pHs. So obviously the big one, as Spencer mentioned, would be the digester, because in the digester we get a lot of that ammonia and phosphate release from the hydrolysis of the biomass. Um, and sometimes there can also be high pH in the digester as well, uh, depending on how good your pH control is, or maybe you're just running it a little bit higher. Um, the next one is the dewatering. So this could be like on the centrifuges or belt presses, just whatever type of dewatering object you is. And this kind of follows from the digester because obviously the digester digested is going to the dewatering process and it's very high in um, nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, so you might see some struvite precipitation there. Another one to look at is near the aerators because struvite precipitation um, can kind of be accelerated or is more favorable, I should say, in uh, cases where there's lots of turbulence. And then finally, the sludge transfer lines. So this can happen in the ROS and WAS lines. You can see a little bit of struvite precipitation there, but obviously it's a much bigger, much bigger problem after the digester. So anywhere where the digested sludge is being transferred, where you have that high ammonia and phosphate, as I've iterated a few times now, there's going to be a potential for struvite precipitation. <clears throat> All right, uh, so I just wanted to quickly um, highlight a couple of struvite recovery technologies. Uh, these are just common ones uh, available out in the marketplace. Uh, so there's Neuresis, Fosfac, Megprex, or Airprex. It's the same thing, it just depends on if you're in Europe or uh, North America, and Pearl. Um, and all of these can actually be modeled in GPSX. Uh, I recently modeled a neuresis process uh, for a client using the aerated struvite recovery object, one of our two struvite recovery objects. Uh, and yeah, I'm going to get to explaining exactly how to use those objects um, actually basically right now. So yeah, I'm going to talk now about how we actually go uh, about the practice of modeling the struvite precipitation in GPSX. So the struvite precipitation process that I showed a few slides back is included in the Mantis 2S model. And what that means is that any object in GPSX with biological reactions, so as Spencer showed, all those brown colored objects, so a digester, a bioreactor, any of the biofilm objects, they can all experience struvite precipitation. Uh, so just like we discussed how in a real plant there's the potential for struvite precipitation in many undesirable or unexpected locations, the same thing can actually happen in GPSX because uh, we allow for it to happen. So if the conditions are there where struvite precipitation is ideal, you'll, your GPSX model is actually going to capture that and probably precipitate a little bit of struvite in that object. But in addition to that, we actually also have these two intentional struvite recovery objects. So these are objects that we are actually trying to use to recover the struvite so that we avoid all this unnecessary and unwanted struvite precipitation at other places in the plant. So these are the uh, struvite recovery and aerated struvite recovery object. And I'll get to an explanation of them in a second. First, I just wanted to highlight this one other object that's important to struvite recovery, which is the nutrient dosage object. Obviously, um, there's not a lot of magnesium typically just in the wastewater. So we do typically need to dose magnesium uh, for a successful uh, struvite precipitation. And that's why uh, this object is important. <clears throat> All right, so first I'll talk a bit about the struvite recovery object. So it's actually an upflow granular bed reactor and the uh, model uses a bed fluidization model to estimate the granular bed height 
and the solids concentration in the effluent stream. And then obviously, as I said, the Mantis II model is used for the precipitation calculations. Uh, this reactor is typically fed dewater digested along with magnesium, so isn't typically used on thick sludges just because of the more granular uh, nature and the upflow of the reactor. Um, so the struvite granules, they form in the reactor and then settle to the bottom uh, to be collected, and then the nutrient reduced effluent uh, flow is from the top of the reactor. So this is just a look at the physical menu of the reactor. So you can see here we have the cross-sectional area and the height of the reactor. Uh, so this is a bit different than a CSTR where we just have the volume, but here we need to specify these two dimensions independently rather than just specifying the volume because of the fact that we have those bed fluidization and settling models. So we need to know the height. It's very important, um, very important for the uh, modeling of the system. And then also we have the reactor parameters uh, menu here. This is mostly just uh, a few parameters relating to the granule size and properties of the granules. Um, but at the bottom, there's also some parameters that are relating to the solids capture and the settling. Uh, so it's a little bit of a complex model, but it does represent some of the common technologies that are available for, for recovering struvite from dewater digested. Uh, so it, it's definitely a good one to use um, if you're uh, using one of those technologies. Okay, so now the aerated struvite recovery object. So this one is um, a little bit simpler, I would say, just in the sense that it's more like a CSTR. It's uh, basically a CSTR object. It can be used for any type of influent as well. Um, it's more of the jack of all trades type of object. Uh, so. In this case, you just only have to um, specify the volume of the reactor as with a typical CSTR um, object. And then in the reactor parameters menu, um, there's a bunch of oxygen transfer settings, which makes sense as this is the aerated struvite recovery object. So you can specify the airflow, the oxygen transfer efficiency, alpha factor, uh, fouling constant, things of that nature. And you'll notice actually here where we have the defaults shown on the screen is that the defaults are actually pretty low for the alpha factor and uh, standard oxygen transfer efficiency, especially compared to what you'd see in a bioreactor. And uh, that obviously implies that there's uh, going to be some pretty poor oxygen transfer to the liquid. And that's just kind of representative of the fact that we expect the uh, influent to this to be pretty thick. And then obviously you're also precipitating struvite within the reactor. So the oxygen transfer isn't going to be as good um, as a bioreactor. But obviously these can be changed depending on how thick of an influent you're actually treating. Uh, so it's one of those parameters that you probably will need to calibrate uh, when you're working with this object. And then again, there's also the solids capture parameters uh, there at the bottom of the reactor parameters menu as well. <clears throat> okay, so I just now want to give a very, uh, I guess, short discussion or example of how you can actually set up a struvite recovery process in GPSX and kind of just walk through uh, the key elements of a facility where struvite recovery is actually a viable choice. Um, so the first thing obviously is you need a nutrient removal process. Um, you need a nutrient dense sludge if you want to recover struvite. Um, so that's a sludge from typically you'd need a bio P process because there's a lot of phosphorus in that sludge. Um, and then the next thing you need is a digester, obviously. So you digest that thickened sludge and the hydrolysis obviously happens. It releases the phosphate and the nitrogen um, into the digestate stream. And then finally, obviously, you're going to need a struvite recovery reactor and a magnesium dosage uh, just to actually do the struvite um, recovery. All right, so now I'm going to give a little bit of a desktop demonstration. Uh, but before I jump into GPSX, I'm first just going to uh, kind of walk through the layout on the slide here and just give a bit of a precursor. So. Um, the first thing I wanted to highlight is that obviously you can see here we have a nutrient removal process. So uh, this is an EBPR process, so we are going to see a lot of phosphorus in that wasted sludge, so that's good. And then here we have the digester, so we're going to get that uh, phosphate and ammonia release. Um, so another box checked. And then, of course, the struvite recovery process. So we have the aerated struvite recovery reactor I'm using in this case, and then a magnesium feed to that reactor. So the little wrinkle I added here is that I put a splitter in. So we're actually gonna be comparing two plant configurations. First, we're gonna be looking at what the plant runs at when we're not recovering any struvite and kind of the effluent quality, uh, some of the operational parameters. And then we're going to be 
um, so sorry, that's that green line there. So we're going to be splitting along that green line uh, rather uh, than letting anything go through the struvite recovery reactor. And then as you've probably guessed, the second thing we're going to do is look at what happens when we use the struvite recovery reactor and just increase the magnesium dose to the struvite reactor and just see how um, recovering more and more struvite affects the process. Okay, so I'll jump to GPSX now. <clears throat> so this is just obviously the layout I just showed on the slide there. We have the nutrient removal process, the digester, and then pulling to the splitter where it can go either around the struvite recovery process or uh, through the struvite recovery reactor. So in this case, um, I'll just start running the simulation right now. So this case, we're running around the reactor, so we're not actually doing any struvite recovery. Um, you can see the influent uh, orthophosphate is around eight grams per meter cubed. Uh, and the influent nitrogen is around 35 grams of nitrogen per meter cubed. So there's an appreciable amount coming in. Uh, and looking at the effluent, we can actually see that or the BioP process isn't doing that great of a job. Um, you typically want the BioP process to get down to around uh, less than one uh, milligram per liter of uh, orthophosphate in the effluent. And here we're around 3.7. Um, the other graphs here, I'll just go over quickly. So this is the massive struvite recovered graph. Obviously, we're not running uh, the struvite recovery reactor in this case, so we don't see any mass recovered. Uh, here we have the concentration of total phosphorus in that recycle stream to the headworks. So that's this stream right here uh, where we have that combiner uh, coming back to the headworks. And then finally, I also have the total cost um, graph. So we can see right now the total cost is around $105. And just to be clear, this cost includes everything from aeration, chemical cost, sludge hauling, pumping, basically all of the operational costs at the plant, and then the obviously the sludge hauling as well. Okay, uh, one thing more just before I show the uh, struvite recovery is I'm just going to jump over to the Sankey diagram. So this is a really uh, nice diagram for visualizing mass flows throughout the plant. So uh, here I've switched the variable at the top to total phosphorus. So now we're looking at the total phosphorus uh, flow in kilograms per day through the plant. You can kind of see the thickness of the line here uh, shows how much mass is flowing there. Uh, so in the influent, we have 20 kilograms per day of total phosphorus. And you can see the effluent, we have around 9.7 uh, kilograms per day. So we're not actually removing that much of the total phosphorus in the effluent. Um, or from the influent, uh, even though we have a BioP process. So that's that's not ideal. Uh, and then over here, the rest of the phosphorus is just leaving in the sludge. So 9.7 plus 10.3 um, equals 20. So uh, we can see that the uh, total phosphorus um, mass is all accounted for. And obviously, there's none here in the uh, struvite reactor, as we would expect, as we're not actually sending any flow that way. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to the struvite recovery scenario. So uh, now just as a reminder, in this case, the flow from the splitter is going to be all going through, um, through the uh, struvite recovery reactor. Uh, and I'm going to be running a sensitivity analysis on the magnesium flow rate to the reactor. So I'm going to be starting from zero and varying uh, the sensitivity analysis up or the magnesium flow rate up to 0.6, because um, we just kind of want to see what's going to happen as we precipitate more and more struvite. So as we get more phosphorus out uh, through the struvite, how is that going to affect everything else uh, going on at the plant? So I'll just start running that now. Uh, while I'm actually starting to run this, uh, one thing I forgot to mention here is this sludge disposal cost over here. This is actually a negative number because this is for the fertilizer truck, so the struvite that we're uh, going to be selling. So I've put negative $410 per ton just to represent the money that we're making on the struvite. And that's going to be going into the actual operating cost calculation as well. Uh, so immediately uh, looking at how the uh, simulation results are going, we can see that as we um, dose more magnesium, we're obviously recovering more and more struvite in the struvite reactor, and the effluent orthophosphate is actually going down as well. So that's really great. Now we're doing a lot better BioP, and that's obviously because if you look over here at the total phosphorus recycled to the headworks, now we're recycling a lot less phosphorus. 
uh, we're down to about half of what we were doing before. And then finally, looking at the cost graph, if you remember, we were around $105 before. So for most of this uh, flow rate up to about 0 0.35, 0 0.4 ish, uh, we're actually below that cost. So even though we've added the cost of uh, the chemical magnesium, um, which would obviously increase the increase our operating cost a bit, the fact that we're selling this Truvite has actually offset that. Um, so that's really great. So we've reduce the costs a tiny bit, but still you could basically say we've kept the costs roughly the same, but we've increased the plant performance a ton. Um, and probably also if we were having any issues with uh, struvite scaling, we probably uh, would have helped mitigate that as well. The fact that we're taking all the struvite out uh, in the reactor as regards to everywhere else in the facility. Okay, so now I'll just jump over to the Sankey diagram uh, one more time just to see how it's changed. So here you can see that we've actually um, reduced a ton of the uh, total phosphorus uh, in the effluent. It was at 9.7, I believe, before. Now it's down to 2.5. Uh, and we do have some phosphorus uh, coming out uh, in the struvite uh, stream as well. We're at 4.8. Um, but one thing that I did notice and I thought was kind of interesting when I was setting this up is that we have actually more uh, phosphorus coming out here than we did before. And you would think that most of it would go to struvite to the struvite stream, uh, but there's actually um, a bit more coming out here. And I realize this is because when I ran the sensitivity analysis, um, that this is showing the last uh, dose used in a sensitivity analysis, which we could actually tell by looking at that graph uh, that we are kind of overdosing. So the mass of the struvite recovered was peaked around here um, at a dose of around 0.35, maybe 0.4 and we kept dosing we actually lost some struvite recovery there which probably meant that there's magnesium then recycling through the plant and that might be why we're getting more struvite recovery in the digester so i'll just jump back to the slides now where i actually do have that sankey uh diagram ready to show yeah so you can see here uh in this case it's still um a little bit high but we now have around six kilograms uh, per day coming out in the struvite recovery stream and around 11 and a half. So we reduced, we basically took about one kilogram per day from uh, the sludge that we were paying, uh, paying for someone to remove and are now uh, brought it over to here and got more struvite, which we are actually, someone is paying us to remove. Uh, so it's uh, basically a win-win there. Okay. Um, now I'm just going to briefly uh, give a little bit of a summary on uh, what I talked about. So first, um, the struvite precipitation process is a pretty, uh, it's a standard part of the comprehensive Mantis II model. So it's um, in any object really, like any, any object with biological reactions, there's a possibility that struvite precipitation can occur. Uh, it's not only in the struvite precipitation reactors. Uh, but GPSX does include two objects specifically for struvite precipitation, uh, and these objects can be used to model basically all of the common struvite precipitation technologies on the market. And then finally, you can use GPSX to explore a cost benefit scenario like we just did and see what the effect of adding a struvite precipitation process to a facility would be. 